So it's with great pleasure uh, that I'm introducing uh, Uli Sattler for this year's Great Moments in KR Talk, which will be on Description Logic and OWL, a tale of discoveries, design choices, challenges, and lessons learned. So uh, Uli uh, is quite some time now a professor at the University of, of Manchester. Prior to that, uh, she did her PhD in Aachen in 1998 and her habilitation at TU Dresden in 2003. And actually when I was researching her bio, I discovered that she had another career <laughs> for a short time before um, going into computer science as, as a dressmaker actually. So I, I think all of us who have known <laughs> all of uh, Uli's contributions to the area are, are very happy that she switched uh, focus and, and, and uh, joined the, 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 the KR community. So uh, Uli has really been a, a central figure in the area of description logics and ontology engineering. Um, notably, more recently, she was one of the co-authors of a very nice uh, textbook, An Introduction to Description Logics. Um, in terms of, kind of notable research contributions, um, she, together with some other colleagues, uh, they designed the Schroik family of description logics, which underpin um, the OWL web ontology language, which is a standard of, of the W3C. Um, and also uh, developed reasoning procedures in order to make it actually possible to do reasoning in these very highly expressive logics. Um, and she also got to see the standardization. I think someone here might have, I don't know, some audio on. There's a little bit of interference. Um, so she also got to see the standardization efforts uh, from the inside as, as a member of the W3C OWL working group, which was responsible for standardizing OWL2, which is the, the current version of, of the, the language. So uh, in addition to studying more classical uh, reasoning tasks, uh, Ule has really pioneered work on a range of novel reasoning problems um, that are important for ontology engineering and for making just uh, the ontologies usable. And in particular, she's on work on uh, module extraction and decomposition, on the explanation of entailments, and uh, mining axioms from data. And in particular, the work on justifications has been a very, very influential. Um, so there are paper receiving both the best paper award from the International Semantic Web Conference, as well as the 10 year award showing that this was kind of this a sort of test of time award in the semantic web area. Um, so Uli has been a major figure in logic based knowledge representation as such she's of course done a wide range of activities and responsibilities, so she was the PC chair of this conference KR in 2010 as well as the International Joint Conference on Automated Reasoning in 2012, been on the editorial board or is currently on the editorial board of major journals like Journal of Automated Reasoning or Logic and Computation, and of course on the on steering committees and PC membership on a wide range of, of venues in our area, so very, very involved in our community. And given both the significance and scope of the contributions going both the more foundational work with complexity reasoning algorithms and formalization um, and also really this more you know practically minded work trying to understand how to put these techniques really in, into practice and what are the needs there uh, it was very natural for us to invite uh, Uli to to give this great moments in KR talk and so I will not take more of Uli's time and I'll pass it over to her for what promises to be a very interesting talk Okay, thank you very much, Megan. And I'll just quickly set up. Give me a second. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much, um, Megan, for the kind introduction and Megan and Gerhard for the very kind invitation. It's a great honor to be here. And um, I hope I can give you um, a nice overview of the last 40 plus years in this area. Um, this is mainly targeted at people who don't quite know so much about um, the area and how, um, I don't know, OWL and everything just came all about. Um, Right, so let's start at the beginning, and the beginning was in 1980, so this is 41 years ago, 
there was the first KL1 workshop, which was really the first description logic workshop, but it was only, we only had one description logic, or roughly, a main description logic called KL1 at that time, and so it was called the KL1 workshop, and it was with about 80 participants and chaired by Ron Brahman. And back at the time, so just, just to give you a taste how long this is ago, people had ARPANET email addresses like this one um, of Ron Brahman. It didn't even have any anything like .edu at the end. This was before we had um, these kind of email addresses and domain names, etc. Um, and um, so Ron Brahman has had a stellar career. He's currently at the prestigious Jacobs Technion um, Connell and Connell Tech. Um, and the BBND, I didn't know this at all. It stands for Bold, Baranek and Newman. And they, this was a very impressive and still is a research and development company, which included people like John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky. So he was in great company there. And so Ron led the development of um, KL1, which basically was the very first description logics. This, and KL1 was heavily influenced by structured inheritance networks, and graphical representations for knowledge in particular about classes and descriptions and concepts and their roles and instances of them, all by means of these um, nice pictures. Um, KL1 was really aimed at knowledge representation. It was not a logic. So description logic wasn't born as a logic. It was born as a knowledge representation formalism. And logic was only used to avoid inconsistencies and ambiguities, in particular between different reasoners, etc. Back at the time, they even had an inference system or what we nowadays would call a reasoner. And so in 85, when um, Brahman and Schmalzer wrote about KL1, they had a footnote to their um, lovely paper where they apologized for not including everybody who contributed there. So this is now 36 years ago. And back then in a long paper, the names of people was um, the, the number of names to pe of, of, of people who contributed was too large and the different kinds of contributions made were, were also too large so they couldn't thank them all and this brings me to a little disclaimer i will not be able to tell all the great things that people have designed and found out and proved and i'll give a very small sliver um of a history um, from description logics to OWL and today um, with yeah a lot of possibly funny choices around them or weird choices but so so there are lots and lots more and I will yeah hint at some of them every now and then but that's it okay so apologies if I didn't mention some contributions but I just can't um, so KL1 was a blueprint for description logics. It had a lot of interesting features that were later found in other description logics. And so, for example, um, it comes with a well-defined semantics. So if you read a standard paper on description logics, it's one of the first things people say. Description logics are knowledge representation formalisms with a well-defined semantics. KL1 had that. Um, and it was already built around concepts and subsumption. This was at the core of KL1. It distinguished assertions, which later became A-box statements, and descriptions, which later became T-box statements, terminological or class level um, knowledge um, about classes, concepts, and the terms they denote. And they already distinguished between primitive or undefinable such concepts, or only partly definable such concepts, and defined ones. Um, and they used constructors to describe those concepts, and they already had quite a number of these constructors. So we had number restrictions, we had subroles, we had nominals already, and we had role value maps. And as I mentioned earlier, we had a reasoner for classification which meant that already in KL1 the inferred concept hierarchy played a central role. So 
every now and then somebody starts asking, so why is this inferred class hierarchy? Why is that the standard reasoning problem um, for description logic knowledge bases or, or ontologies? And it is because it's one of the central and traditional and most easily showable way of showing all entailments. So clearly we can't show all entailments and people agreed very early on that subsumptions or implications between named concepts, concept names, are the central thing that people want to know about their knowledge base. So other people call it the taxonomy, which is, is a bit debatable, but that was already there. Another thing that was already present in KL1 is its solid um, foundation, not just in logic, but also in application. So KL1, um, despite the fact that it was very early, was already used in not just toy problems, but in large natural language processing projects like question answering, which may surprise that you know, that it already existed back then, but it did. And in natural language generation and a few more. So very interesting. So KL1 started it all and was super successful. And, and so, so this was not this was the first KL1 workshop in 1980, but a few more followed. And um, this could have all gone really well if Manfred Schmidt-Haus hadn't suddenly um, come up with the insight that subsumption in KL1 is undecidable. And this was quite a shock because people thought that this inference system was not just sound or just complete, but sound complete and terminating. And so what, what does this subsumption now mean exactly? Um, it means given two possibly complex concept descriptions, C and D, is it the case that every instance of one is also an instance of the other one? In first order logic terms, it means given two formulas in one free variable, C and D, does, is, is the, universal, the universally quantified implication between them valid? And KL1, we, I only showed you an example picture of a little knowledge base, KL1 was not a very expressive logic. So how is this possible? In fact, it was sub-Boolean. We only had conjunction and universal value restriction, which is basically a cousin of the box modality in model logics and so and the so-called role value maps. So this was KL1, they had a few th other things, but it did not have negation. It did not have disjunction or existential restriction. And the terminologies, the kind of axioms that you could form in your knowledge base were very, very restricted as well. You could not have general T boxes or general concepts inclusion as you can have in, in modern description logics. Um, so, these role value maps, they are a bit unusual. And what are they? They are constructors that allow you to describe elements such that if you follow um, their R1, R2 and so on, Rn chain um, of roles, as we call binary predicates in description logics, you get to the same elements as if you follow the S1 to Sn chain. So we should really draw them like this. And these role value maps were then found to be the culprit of subsumption in KL1. The proof is by a really nice um, reduction of the word problem in groups and yeah, makes heavy use of those role value maps, of course. Okay, so what happened next? People didn't just say, okay, then we can't do terminological knowledge representation um, or we can't express anything like this, but they just said, okay, this is interesting. Let's see whether we can't design a DL that is a bit more well-behaved. In particular, that's decidable. So people looked at more constructors and more reasoning problems. So in KL1, we were just 
looking at um, the reasoning problem, whether a subsumption holds regardless of any kind of background knowledge. And this was then extended to whether a subsumption holds in a given T box, for example. And these T boxes started to change. We had acyclic T boxes. They are just they are basically macro definitions where for a name you can you, so where you can give a name to a concept expression. Um, and then people started looking into possibly cyclic such um, T boxes and general T boxes. And the, our understanding of these reasoning problems and these constructors and how the, how they affect complexity decidability grew massively. Um, we learned very um, much more about what causes decidability and undecidability. That there are some very nice papers being written about this, um, and of course also with respect to computa computational complexity. And um, I don't know how many hundreds of papers you will find about description logic computational complexity of various um, reasoning problems. Um, so, and of course, we have tight complexity re, um, results with lower bounds. And these lower bounds, I, I just mentioned that a lot of them were inherited um, from modal logics um, and some of the techniques as well for proving them. Um, so modal logic, as mentioned earlier, are close cousins to description logics, to, to quite different in taste a little bit, um, and also in the kind of constructors used. And upper bounds, people started to develop more and more optimal algorithms, quite a few of them automata based, if you haven't come across those before. And so basically what happened after um, KL1 was the one first description logics, we started to see um, a description logic family to arise. So this aforementioned um, sentence that you find in many description logic papers about description logics being a family, it's really, so, and the, the family was started basically shortly um, around KL1 and it started to grow and grow and grow. And the other thing that happened is that many reasoners were developed for description logics. People looked into those and one of them was called classic and classic um, was influenced by the undecidability in the sense that okay they said no no we can't have very many constructors we go very um definitely polynomial and tractable um whereas the chris people these brave young men here they decided no we go for a piece-based complete description logics and we will dare to develop a reason for that good um and they not only designed a reasoning algorithm, they also implemented it and thoroughly empirically evaluated it. And that um, was quite impressive at the time. And they used a reasoning algorithm that was based, uh, based on two things. One, they used a tableau algorithm for testing subsumption between concepts, and they used an enhanced traversal for their classification. And I'll come back to this a few times. So, so this is a very naive picture of the architecture of a Chris or Chris-like reasoner, or in general of a tableau-based description logic reasoner. So in goes some T-box, out comes the inferred concept hierarchy, and in order to get from one to the other, these reasoners basically use three parts. So of course they do some pre-processing, and they then use this so-called enhanced traversal algorithm. And this enhanced traversal algorithm just decides which subsumption question to ask next to the subsumption checker. And the subsumption checker then tell, um, decides this subsumption question and answers this with yes or no. And the interesting and trailblazing part of Chris is that if you were to do this enhanced traversal naively, so if it wasn't enhanced, then if you had n concepts, then you would need to do to, to carry out n square tests or n square half tests, whatever. Um, and each of them, even for the description logic underlying Chris, was known to be p space hard. 
the really clever bit about Chris and the, the thing that made Chris get to move on was this enhanced traversal algorithm which went from n square to n log n tests. So this was very important and it was followed up by many other reasoners um, and also the fact of course that it used a provably sound complete and terminating tableau based algorithm. So, so these are the main two ingredients of these reasoners and Chris really had a very long lasting strong impact on the whole area and not only did other reasoners follow the architecture and further develop and, and, and extend it, but also people thought, okay, P-Space might sound really hard, but Chris manages to get through big ontologies quite quickly. So that was Chris, but, of course they said, but um, Chris was restricted to acyclic T-boxes, these aforementioned macro definitions, basically and therefore to a piece-based description logic only. Yes. So if you wanted to say that healthy people have only healthy body parts and that a human has a mother who's also a human and also a father who's human, then you couldn't say that in, in Chris, which may be a bit problematic if you wanted, if you had an application where this was really important. Um, so the next kid on the block was FACT. This was developing in Horrocks and it extends the CRIS architecture and idea with a few optimizations, but the one I really want to point out here is absorption. So as part of the pre-processing, there's a new additional step there, absorption, um, and a few other things that then allowed FACT to deal with these general concept inclusions and therefore with an X time hard DL. So we have a real big step in the computational complexity of the description logics that FACT can handle. And so now you can make all these cyclic um, statements, but you can also make um, more things So our, our implications now can have complex expressions on the left-hand side and we don't quite care about left-hand or right-hand side anymore. Good. And despite each, each of those subsumption checks being X time hard and, and thanks to all these um, very effective optimizations, fact was surprisingly fast and blew out quite a few other reasoners. So, and these two together then led to many more other reasoners being built. Um, they, they, they're Cilicia, so, so the classic I mentioned before, then we have Chris, Fact, Racer, DLP, Pallet, and so Fact had a few, few children as well. Um, there's Hermit I want to mention because Hermit doesn't quite follow this architecture. Hermit is not based on a Tableau algorithm, but on a hyper Tableau. And it doesn't use the enhanced traversal, but the enhanced enhanced traversal. This is not a typo. And it's also known as the known possible set approach. Um, and further improved this behavior. And I would like to come back briefly to this enhanced traversal. So this enhanced traversal drops the number of um, expensive subsumption tests from n square to n log n and one of my favorite empirical um, evaluations we ever ran is one where we try to so, to investigate hmm, how many subsumption tests does enhanced traversal avoid so if you think about it the more of those subsumption tests you avoid the faster your reasoner will be and um, in order to do this, um, especially with Nico, we looked into in at, at that time in, in, into four reasoners, um, two versions of FACT plus Hermit, the aforementioned hyper tableau based one in Pellet, and, and traced the number of subsumption tests they ran. So on the x axis here, you see um, ontologies of different size, you see the number of tests on a logarithmic scale. And you see in green 
um, the n square theoretically naive number of tests required. You see in red the n times log n, so it will make a difference, of course. And in blue, you see the number of subsumption tests really carried out by those reasoners. And you will notice that the two fact reasoners, they mostly avoid massively more than the um, estimated um, log n uh, subsumption tests, but sometimes they run more than n log n, so this is a bit of a funny thing. Pellet consistently stays below this n log n theoretical bound, but quite often is only needs much, much fewer than this. And Hermit is quite different. So, so this enhanced, enhanced traversal really works very nicely there. Um, it stays consistently well below this red line. And so I re 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 please remember that this is a logarithmic scale. So, so this is really quite a nice game there. So, and that's due to this enhanced, enhanced traversal. Okay, so where are we? Um, in our history. We are, um, so we know by, uh, at that time after FECT++ and these reasoners have been designed, we, we have long since discovered that description logics, despite being designed as knowledge representation formalisms, they are decidable fragments of first order logic. Um, they are closely related to modal logics um, and the guarded fragment um, of first order logic and hybrid logics, of course. So nominals um, in hybrid logic course is are a stronger or a more general form of A box individuals. And they capture the monotonic aspects of the graphical systems they have been designed for. And they are a family of knowledge representation formalisms with well defined semantics, one of the main selling points, but a funny syntax. So what do I mean by that? So they are, description logics have always been designed with a variable free syntax, like in modal logic, despite the fact that we are, um, that they are um, first order logic fragments, their syntax doesn't have variables. And this is like in modal logic, but unlike in modal logic, we have we find in description logic many, many constructors. And these many constructors, just to give you a, an idea of how many there are, if, you, if you're not aware of this, um, this here is a screenshot of the description logic complexity navigator where you can pick some of those constructors and then they ask the navigator what's the computational complexity of it. And you, you are spoiled for choice there. You have quite a few um, of these. And, it doesn't even cover all, so, so there are a few role characteristic um, shown here in a protege screenshot um, that you can pick and which aren't even covered. So, so there are tons of these constructors, like really tons of them. And they come for, they're used to build axioms and expressions for concepts and for roles, and they are about concepts and roles and individuals. So basically what we see is that our description logic is growing massively. And so I couldn't find a bigger um, Adams family here. So, so we have to um, understand that when I say EL++ here, this is not just one logic, there's a whole gaggle of logics around there. Between ALC and CHIC, there's another whole gaggle of logics. Um, between FL0, KM and CLASSIC, there, there are quite a few. Above CHIC, there are yeah, more than those three here, really. Below ALC, there are more. And DL Lite, I mean, DL Lite is not one logic, it's it's a big family on its own. And yeah, we have many fuzzy DLs as well. So, 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 so they grow and they grow. And so let's put this into the historical perspective that um, we wanted to look at again. Where are we? So in, in 98, fact has broken this X time barrier after Chris breaks the, um, the P-space barrier in 92. In 88, subsumption um, in KL1 was shown to be undecidable. And this is the few things I mentioned so far. So what happens next? Next, because of these many, many constructors um, hampering development, basically, of these reasoners, 
because of this, Peter Patel Schneider in um, 1993 designed the first KRSS specification for a usable syntax across different reasoners. So this would allow reasoner builders and ontology or knowledge base constructors allow to use a shared syntax so that they can use different reasoners that also all would support this, this shared syntax. And of course the shared syntax came with a agreed upon semantics, so all is good. So this was really important and shortly thereafter people started also to talk about ontology rather than um, knowledge bases. So before ADL knowledge base was a T box and an A box and suddenly people started to call either the T box or the whole knowledge base ontology. Um, and this was before Tim Berners-Lee wrote the, in the, the famous We Wing the Semantic Web um, that introduced the vision of the semantic web. And Already at the same time then after KRSS, so, so KRSS was a rather Lisp style um, syntax for description logics. Then the first DIG interface was um, published by Sean Beckhover, Ian Horrocks, Peter Patel Schneider and Sergio Tessaris. And this is basically a generic DL reasoner interface built on something called Corba, which nobody will remember, or perhaps some people will remember. And this was, I only mention this piece because it was really a move towards web um, syntax and web think around applications. And this was at the same time as Tim Berners-Lee publishing um, his, his famous paper. Um, and we already had a first um, oil which was um, one of the um, one of the it was not the only one of the early ontology languages it um, oil is an acronym standing either for um, ontology into ontology inference layer or our ideas of a language and this was um, briefly thereafter um, followed by double plus oil which um, where, where the oil people joined um, the, 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 the DARPA ontology language people and again um, there's yeah these are mainly these are description logic people who think that a web compatible description logic or web based description logic would be a good idea and then all this led up to the establishment of the first W3C owl working group. Between 2001 and 2004, this is now already a long time ago, so this working group was set up with this vision, vision of the semantic web. You notice I'm not going to show the layer cake picture. Um, it was it was made possible by and enabled through um, existing emerging ontology languages and specifications, in particular the one called Dummel Plus, I mentioned earlier, and um, various people um, supported using description logics as a logical basis. They, and this was not by no means a given. There were other people who said, oh no, description logic, there are so many of them and they are funny and we don't like them. Um, but partly because of the existence of these powerful reasoners that are provably sound and complete and that performed really well on rather large um, input ontologies. Um, OWL was then based on description logics as an ontology language on, that builds on current web languages like RDF and XML that allows the specification of classes and subclasses, properties and subproperties, and on top of RDFS, etc., with um, constructs. So they're the constructors again to allow more complex relationships. So we want complex relationships as well. And there, as, as I mentioned, the people in this first web on um, ontology working group, so there was Sean Beckover again, and Ian Horrocks, Deborah McInnes, Peter Patel Schneider, and, and quite, so, so this was a big working group, big effort, and in 2004, only three years after starting, and many, many very long and um, deep 
teleconferences about how owls should look like. The first owl was standardized in 2004. Now, what happened then? Um, as you can imagine, having the standards um, being launched caused um, quite a lot of excitement. And as you have seen on my timeline, even before it was really um, standardized, people started to build more tools around it and people got really enthusiastic about things and um, started to build more ontologies. And so there's the famous BioPortal repository of, in, of ontologies in biohealth on applications or for biohealth applications and it currently contains 698 ontologies. So people do build ontologies and a, some of them, to be really careful, some of them are used in real applications. Um, and we see, so, so people start to use this technology, start to use the language to build applications and of course they come back with more requirements. Um, and there, this is just the, a very short list of these requirements, but in particular there are two requirements, but also um, we need domain experts that are able to write OWL ontologies, that are able to formulate their logic in OWL, so, so there's training needs, there is um, requirements around performance and scalability of reasoners and not just speed but also robustness. So one of the things that happened is that people started with their ontology and it went well and it classified quickly, classified quickly and suddenly they built, uh, they add one more axiom and it becomes really slow and that is not a good thing to happen. And of course, people also, users asked for new non-standard reasoning algorithms. And the central one that Megan mentioned it in a, a, her kind introduction was explanation. So if the reasoner comes back and says, your class here is subsumed by bottom or is um, unsatisfiable, of course, or your, even worse, your whole ontology is inconsistent. There cannot be a model of this. Um, of this ontology, then of course um, users want a Y button and need help to repair their ontology. Um, and of course this then led to the development of more tools, this lovely interaction between this description logics um, owl and applications, this started to or had always formed a very nice virtuous cycle. So people build more APIs, more editors or um, integrated development environments for ontologies that are related to reasoners. And of course they build more reasoners. So we talked about these reasoners before, then um, this is now um, a little bit already looking into the future. More reasoners are built all the time. So Sequoia and Pagoda are two uh, from the University of Oxford, from, from Ian Horrocks' group. Uh, Sequoia is consequence-based. Um, I come back a little bit um, to that. And a Pagoda is approximation-based and has um, makes use of some really clever ideas. Um, other reasoning problems. I, I will not go into ontology-based data access and um, query answering and query languages. Um, I just want to mention that there are tools like Ontop and Maestro that have been built and are have been heavily used for this purpose. And of course also RDF OSOX, which is materialization-based. Good. That's where we are. So OWL has been standardized in 2004 and then even before that the description logics EL was designed and that design came as a bit of a, um, of a surprise um, because EL is somehow the most well-behaved robust description logic and it was only found so, so if you remember this big family picture, all these DLs were around, but it was only found um, in 2003. So, and it's so well behaved. So in our family, um, EL is, is the well behaved thing. FL0 was known much before and FL0 is really the bad sister of EL++. FL0 is very unstable. So, so whatever you add on top of FL0, 
um, it becomes more and more complex. In EL++, all reasoning problems, is in particular with respect to um, acyclic, cyclic, and general T-boxes, EL++ doesn't matter, doesn't mind, it stays um, in P-time. Oh yeah, in polynomial time, not in just P-time. So, so in the L++, you can use these general concept inclusion axioms, you can use conjunction, you can use existential restriction. FL0 is the universal um, sister of this existential um, description logic EL, and it is much less well behaved. So this was quite a late kit on the block and it led to this other family of reasoners which I um, I'm, I'm showing there in particular cell elk J cell and snow rocket and these reasoners they have they, they are based on a totally different reasoner namely a one-shot algorithm and that's basically why they are or partly yeah, why they've been so successful. And I would like to um, talk a little bit about this. So for EL, or e, some extensions of EL with um, important um, other constructors, um, our classification algorithm works in a totally different way to these p-space and x-time description logics. So again, so after, re after parsing the um, input, T-box ontology, um, we of course need to do some pre-processing, but then we build a graph of concept names. One graph where each node stands for, one, stands for one concept name, and then we just saturate this graph with consequences from the T-box. And this saturation does not require the introduction of any new nodes. Um, so this is because EL++ has a very small model property. So the, the model properties of description logics have also been investigated very deeply and it's this um, tiny model property of EL that enables us to um, design um, an algorithm like this and, and make it work. And then of course, um, a lot of um, implementation and optimization um, sophistication went into building reasoners that scale very well and um, made EL the success that they are known for. Good. So highly scalable reasoning, thanks to this one-shot um, classification. And I want to just contrast this again, because so for Chris, we already said, oh, it's so cool because it only uses n log n tests. And so that sounds so much better than n square. And it is so much better. But, so I mentioned earlier that, oh yeah, reasoners become much faster um, and therefore the ontologies become bigger. And so SNOMED CT is one of the big old ontologies used for, um, for capturing medical knowledge across the world. And SNOMED CT has about 300,000, um, at, at least 300,000 concept names. So if each of our subsumption tests takes just 10 milliseconds, which is like totally fast, then a little bit of back on the envelope computation will give us a computation time of 15 hours. And this is just basically overnight. That's okay if you have to pay the price, perhaps in your application, but EL um, one-shot classification algorithm can classify SNOMED CT in a few seconds. And then that, of course, um, enables us to interact with an ontology and edit it in, 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 in a much different way than if you have to wait for 15 hours. So this performance scalability um, robustness is, 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 yeah, was really blown out of the water by these EL reasoners. Um, and in addition, and this is really beautiful, I find, um, EL allows um, us allow, has allowed um, us to design new non-standard reasoning um, or support for for non-standard reasoning problems, in particular entailment explanation. So Yevgeny Kazakov and Pavel Klinov um, 
found this wonderful um, way of extracting explanations for entailment from this saturated graph and to present them in a most beautiful way. And as I said earlier, entailment explanation is really, really important. Good. So we are still um, in before 2005, roughly, where um, EL was the new kit on the block. And then a lot of more EL reasoners were designed. Um, and they are really well suited for big terminologies, for, for, for big T boxes, class level ontologies. Other reasoners came along, like Pellet, um, built by Bijan Parcia's group. And the first ontology editors or integrated development environments, like Oilet, um, were designed. And Oilet um, was the first editor that allowed you to write your ontology and press a button and ask the reasoner and then have your um, entailments being displayed in, in a suitable manner. Um, Protégé. Protégé existed before, long before OWL. It was a frame-based system, but it was not connected to any kind of reasoner, but it was connected to an OWL reasoner even before the W3C working group finished. Um, and a third ontology um, editor swoop was built. And I forgot to mention uh, the OWL API here before. This is, this is um, a Java-based interface. Um, for OWL to work with reasoners, it helps you with parsing and so on, and uh, was massively influential and enabled all sorts of people to build all sorts of applications. And there was an OWL ad series of workshops where people met who use OWL and try to build things and ex uh, try to build applications on top of it, it and exchanged information around it. And there was a second OWL. So OWL2 is also based on an expressive description logics, this time called Schroik. Um, apologies for the not so easily to enunciate name. Schroik is um, a further extension of Schick um, with a few things, which I won't explain in detail here. Like the first OWL, it supports XML data types like strings and integers for features like names and ages, very, very important applications. Um, it allows for the annotation of axioms. This has nothing to do with the logic, but it's super important to denote about who, uh, information on who wrote axioms, who introduced a concept, but also to introduce labels and preferred labels and alternative labels and Chinese labels versus English labels two concepts and this is super super duper important so we can distinguish concepts from the terms or words words associated with them so we can deal both with synonyms and homonyms and we can have two terms denoting the same concept or having two terms different terms for sorry the same concept denoting two you know what i mean and this annotation was already present in OIL. So, so when people talk about logics versus knowledge representation, I think this is one of the big, big differences and super important. Um, it comes with an import mechanism for some modular development, but only very basic. And that would be a work for um, perhaps all three to improve on this with a versioning mechanism with many different syntaxes. So this has grown from all one to all two and with three fragments or so-called profiles for specific use cases, in particular for the aforementioned um, EL++ in form of all to el for large terminologies, but also for ontology-based data access in the form of DL Lite or a version of DL Lite and RL for the rule fragment. And I want to spend three more minutes on a highlight and an oddity. So a highlight brings us back right to the beginning about role value maps. Um, so when ontology started to be used and Ian Horrocks fact plus plus of our fact system started to work. So Ian was a, um, a student of Alan Rector. 
he had a wish list. He wanted to be able, so this was Alan Rector's running example, he wanted to be able to say that the head of a femur is part of a femur and that a fracture of the femur is a fracture that is located in the femur. Nothing wrong with this, we can say this in EL. But from that, he wanted to infer that a fracture located in the head of the femur is a fracture of the femur. And of course, this entailment does not hold. Yes? Um, in order for, for this to work, we basically need to say that um, location translates over part of, or that the composition of is located and part of implies is located in. And if we say this, then of course this entailment holds. And this is a wonderful thing to say, um, but it's also a kind of universal role value map. And role value maps were these things that made KL1 undecidable. So they are potentially dangerous for decidability, or at least probably for computational complexity. But um, the nice thing was that um, we found a kind of tame, uh, we find, found a way of taming these role value maps um, by restricting them in two different ways. On the one hand, so, so first the right hand side has to be atomic and there can't be any cyclic dependencies. Um, and it's a nice generalization of transitive roles also known in grammar logic. And now we can model nice things. Um, I'll very briefly skip through an OWL to oddity. Um, OWL is this lovely standardized syntax, but it's a weird syntax. And here's one thing that's weird about it, any reconstructors. So, of course, and quite naturally, in KRSS and in OWL and, and OR and some other constructors, admit any number of symbols as long as it's at, at least one. So you can have an NRE and an NRE are both in KRSS and in OWL. And in OWL in particular, the argument forms a set, so you don't even have um, duplication. And this is really nice because it avoids parentheses, it makes comparisons easy. We know that A and B and C is the same, or I mean, OWL speaks structurally equivalent to A and B and C, and so on. So this is really nice for writing and comparing ontologies, otherwise these would make a difference, and they shouldn't, um, but it makes sub-expressions complicated. So because now A and C is really a sub-expression of A and B and C, we suddenly end up with exponentially many sub-expressions, and that of course scoopers our complexity analysis wherever we assume we only have polynomially many of these. And it also scoops up our pass trees because they are not normal pass trees with ordered symbols. We have unranked symbols, etc. So weirdness oddities, we just have to live with this. Megan, do I have one more minute? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, good. So, so this was a rumbling through um, the history. And um, next steps for our, I, I want to say a little bit about the future. And this, again, is, is just a mini selection, of course. Robust scalability will always be a problem. You make things faster, make, people will create bigger things and demand faster things. So this will never go away. Um, one thing I'm really um, enthusiastic about is high level and macro languages. Um, to capture design choices made by ontology engineers so that our ontologies become more readable and maintainable. And so I have high, high hopes for this. And so this will be on the agenda for any potential OWL3. And of course, the elephant in the room, I mentioned that at all, is the integration of description logics with machine learning. And there are 27 different ways in which we can think about it, probably even more. Um, but one of the things I um, think is very central to a lot of them will be faithful concept embeddings or good concept embeddings. And one of the things we would I would like to see there is that these concept embeddings are able to distinguish the different relationships we have in description logics and now. So concepts can be related or individuals by has part or is located in or by subsumption. And Subsumption in particular has always been special, but if I use a standard word to vector or concept to vector embedding, that all then all I'm left with is just proximity. And that's really 
poor because now things are just closely related that are closely uh, closely related and I have lost a lot of information. I have to put engine close to car and car close to race car and taxi close to race car, but the different relationships between them is lost in the void. And there are so-called n-ball embeddings, n-dimensional embeddings as balls concepts that fix this a little bit and um, where the balls for the ball standing for the car concept would be bigger and include the taxi and the race car and the has part role want would move the car the engine ball into the car ball and thereby um, having a little bit of a reflection of these different relationships so I have high hopes for this um, and I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of interesting work around this. And I can even inter in, yeah, let these balls um, intersect or not. Good. And of course, I have left out a lot of things, but I've totally run out of time. Sorry for this. Um, I'll stop now. Thank you very much.